If you haven't already turned there, you'll want to do that at this time. We have before us a very gnarly chapter, but a very interesting and even fascinating chapter. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer? We'll ask God's blessing on our time in his word. If you would, please join with me. Father in heaven, thank you for this time tonight. We do need, Lord, your Holy Spirit to focus our attention and center our focus upon you and upon your word and that which you would desire to speak to us and minister to us tonight. Lord, we are posturing ourselves before you hungry and thirsty and acknowledging before you that only you can satiate that hunger and that thirst. So Lord, will you? We're asking you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, right out of the chute, verse one. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Told ya. <laughs> How many of you have this on your refrigerator, huh? <laughs> don't raise your hand. <laughs> we don't want to know if you do. Uh, we start off with a pretty intense verse that by any stretch of the imagination would seem to have absolutely no application for us today. But I know that for those of you who have been with us for any length of period of time in our study on Thursday nights of the Old Testament, you know that every word is there in God's word for a reason and that there's something here for us. Now, Moses is dealing with what are called eunuchs, uh, men who were emasculated and unable to reproduce. And here, Moses is telling them that they are forbidden from entering the assembly. Now the question is, why? Here's a thought. It went against the nature of God and it was a crime against God simply by virtue of his command to be fruitful and to multiply and to populate the earth. Furthermore, and think about this, deliberate emasculation, and this is germane to our understanding as it relates to the rest of the chapter, to deliberately do this was a pagan practice. And throughout this, we see this common theme that the Israelites were not to imitate the practices of those nations that were in the land that they're about to possess and even dispossess the land of these nations. Why? Because it was an abomination in the sight of God. Okay, well, how does this apply to us? Well, here's what I'm thinking. It seems to me that this would speak to one allowing anything that would be worldly or deemed a sinful practice, practiced by the world, the lifestyles of the world, I think this is God's way of saying this has no place in the assembly of God's people. Things that we may be prone to welcome under the banner of tolerance if an abomination in my sight should never be allowed to take up residence within the church or a body of believers. You know, you look at the Corinthian church, the carnal church of Corinth, and they were doing this, not necessarily as it relates specifically to this, but principally they were under the banner of being loving and tolerating. They would allow people openly practicing that which would be deemed an abomination in the sight of the Lord. They were allowing it in the church unchecked. And this is why the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, would write his first and second epistle to the Corinthian church. By the way, the love chapter, you know, the chapter that we always, you know, quote and read at weddings, you know, love is, love is. You know that the reason 
for the love chapter was because Paul had to teach them, communicate to them, and even rebuke them and say to them, you have no idea what love is. Let me tell you what love is. This is what love is. This is what love looks like. You think you're being loving by allowing the world to infiltrate and get its tentacles into the assembly of the body of believers? That's not love. You think you're being tolerant? That's not love. This is love. And thus we have love is. Have you ever gone through that list? Have you ever gone through that list lately? I don't encourage you to do it if you're faint at heart because it will convict you, especially if you do this. Insert your name. JD is. JD is. Patient and all of those things. About the second or third one, I'm toast. And I just stopped doing it because I realize I'm not. That's the benchmark, that's the standard, that's the plumb line, that's the gauge by which we measure what is loving and what is not. Now this might be seen at first glance as God being unloving. You mean you don't want these people in the assembly of the Lord, in the tabernacle, and subsequently the temple? Well, not necessarily. This wasn't God saying, I don't love them, I'm rejecting them. No, this was God saying, I don't want them to infiltrate and become a, a people that would, you would desire to imitate. God is protecting the Israelites. And again, this is going to be germane as we see it throughout this chapter. We'll see it again here soon. Verse 2, one of illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So here again, we have now someone else who is forbidden entry into the assembly. Now, this particular verse has been the subject of some debate amongst commentators with some suggesting that these who were of illegitimate birth were born out of incest. Others suggest that these illegitimate births were from the mixed marriages between the pagans and the Israelites, which fits with what we'll see uh, as we get through the chapter. But they were not to enter the assembly. Now, whether it was either or or both, the principle is still the same. There was to be both this reverence and this holiness when entering the assembly of the Lord. There had to be a legitimacy in the assembly of the Lord. Uh, another commentator has some interesting insight when they suggested that this speaks to the new birth and how that God does not have any grandchildren or illegitimate children, if you prefer. In other words, each one of us must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Absent this new birth, it becomes an illegitimate birth, and we are forbidden entrance. Unless a man is born again, he will be forbidden entrance into the kingdom of God. The birth is illegitimate. It's not the new birth. See, God doesn't have any grandchildren. You know, when you talk to people and you say, hey, you know, are you a Christian? They say, yeah, uh, I was born a Christian. No, you weren't. You were born a dirty, rotten, stinking sinner. <laughs> and that's why you need to be born again. The second birth, the new birth, that's the legitimate birth, a spiritual new birth. Verse 3, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Nevertheless, verse 5, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. Now, 
This is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that it demonstrates the far-reaching ramifications of those who are against God and those who are against God's people. And never forget, and make no mistake about it, these people groups whom God is seemingly rejecting have already sealed their fate. Their heart has already been hardened towards God and towards God's people. And that's why Moses tells them to forbid them, the Ammonites and the Moabites, from entering the assembly. And it's really because of what they did and what they did not do to the children and for the children of Israel. Namely, they hired Balaam to curse them and did not offer bread and water on the road to them when they came out of the land of Egypt. Hey, let me parenthetically insert this here. You know in Matthew's gospel where we're told that when you give a glass of water to the least of these, you're giving it to me, the least of my brethren, one translation renders it. Who is he speaking to? The children of Israel, the Jewish people. Some Bible commentators believe that this passage refers to the great tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And whoever uh, takes care of and is kind to and gives water and sustenance to the Jew during the tribulation, the least of these, my brethren, it's as if he is doing it to me. Understand, during the seven-year tribulation, the Jewish people are going to go through literal hell on earth. It is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's going to be an awful time for them and they will have no friends and everyone around them surrounding them will be their enemies and that's why Jesus says what he says and that's why Moses says what he says here because they did not and were not hospitable towards you as you were making your exodus out of Egypt they are forbidden entrance into the tabernacle you should never make a peace agreement with them either and furthermore, they not only didn't bless you, they actually hired this guy to curse you. They didn't offer you the bread and the water, and instead they hired this man to curse you. A couple of things I want to point out here that I think are, uh, again, germane to our understanding. And the first is that it's a needed reminder of the reality of the fact that we have a formidable foe. In the spiritual realm, we have the enemy, Satan, the devil, the enemy of our soul. And I think the problem with us as believers is that we go to either extreme in either underestimating the power of Satan or overestimating the power of Satan and we do both to our own peril some overstate his power and make him equal to God opposite of God he's not Satan is not omniscient or omnipotent or omnipresent he is a created being one said the devil is God's devil and the devil cannot do anything to us unless God allows him to and God will only allow him to do something to us because it will ultimately serve his purpose. So if you ever question in your mind when adversity strikes and you're going through a particular you know, difficult time and the spiritual attack is ramping up and you're crying out to God, God! You know, what's going on? And, you know, the devil is tanning my hide, you know. <laughs> That's, they say that on the mainland. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's just on me like white on rice. And, you know, and never think that God is in heaven going, what? Why didn't you tell me sooner? When did this happen? Gabriel, Michael, get over here. Are you kidding me? No, God knows. The devil is God's devil. He created the devil, and just ask Job. The devil had to ask for permission, and it was under the banner of Job being this righteous man. Boy, I did. that sends chills up my spine when I think about that, because I imagine, you know, when, and it also implies that Satan still has access 
to the throne of God. It's like he's in passing, you know, hey, Satan, how you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great, on fire. Yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, <laughs> What do you, what do you, where you been? Oh, I've just been kind of roaming to and fro throughout the earth. Hey, when you were uh, out and about, did you happen upon my servant Job? Oh, yes, I did, as a matter of fact. Well, yeah, but I mean, there is none righteous like him. And, you know, it's like God's bragging on him. And then here's Satan's response. Oh, yeah, of course he's righteous. You just have nothing but blessing for him. You curse him, and he'll curse you to your face. Oh, really? How much you want to bet? <laughs> and the, I know that sounds raw, but it's really what sort of happened. It was this, this divine, holy challenge. No, he doesn't serve me only because I bless him. He serves me because he loves me. And that's why, and I'll show you, and he did. And we read at the end, in all of this, he did not curse God. His wife did. <laughs> just saying, ladies, his wife said, you know, just get it over with. But he did not. Now, what's the point? Maybe you're asking, do you even have a point? Yes, I do. <laughs> the enemy can do nothing to us unless the Lord allows him to. No weapon forged against you will prosper. And if it seems like the enemy is allowed access to you to bring harm to you, it will always ultimately serve God's purpose in the end. Here's another thing I want to point out. God will always turn the curse of the enemy into a blessing for us. And we're told why here. Moses says it's because the Lord loves you. Ask Joseph when he finally reveals his identity to his brothers. What you intended for evil, God worked for good. I don't know how God does it. I just know that God does it. And I've experienced it in my own life. And there have been times where I've really questioned and doubted with my little faith, my mustard seed sized microscopic faith that you would need a very powerful microscope to see. Microscope to see. I mean, there were times where I just thought, Lord, this, I think I got you on this one. This is so complex. There's no way I cannot, I know that you can work everything out for the good, but this one, I think, has got you stumped, doesn't it? Come on, it does, doesn't you? Because it, it's, so, it's so bad. I cannot see how you're going to work this out for me. You're going to take this meant for evil, and you're going to work it for good, and you're going to turn it into a blessing? I know you love me, but how are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Any time, by the way, Lord. I mean, have you ever noticed that the Lord is never in a hurry? I, I, in the Gospels, I never see Jesus running late. No, seriously, have you ever thought about that? I never see him running late. Oh, what about uh, Lazarus? No, he wasn't late. Uh, Mary and Martha thought he was, but he wasn't late. He was perfectly on time. I never see God in a hurry. There's always a reason. I think of what Isaiah says. He will wait in order to be gracious to you. Sometimes those delays, though not God's denials, are for our Betterment. Uh, I find it interesting that Moses would cite the account of Balaam. You remember from our study back in the book of Numbers, chapter 22, when Balak hires him to curse Israel? In fact, from Numbers chapter 22 through chapter 25, we have this most amazing account. And by the way, you've probably noticed that I don't use words like Bible character, Bible story because it sort of has the connotation of being fictional. So whenever I refer to someone in the Old Testament, you know, particularly, I'll always refer to them not as a, you know, Bible character, but I'll refer to him as this man of God in the Old Testament, this man of, this woman of God in the Old Testament. And I don't refer to it as the story. I refer to it as 
an account. That packs more punch, and so it should, because what we're reading in the pages of Holy Writ is a factual, actual truth that actually happened. You mean to tell me that that donkey actually spoke? You betcha. Well, why do you say that? Well, I say that because every Thursday night and Sunday morning, God speaks through this donkey, and I can attest to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you get the idea. <laughs> but no matter what he did, he could not pronounce a spiritual curse on the Israelites. This Balak, this king of the Moabites, did everything, tried everything. And what's so interesting is that Balaam and Balak are again mentioned in the book of Revelation, amongst other places in the Bible. And in the book of Revelation, which we'll come to a little bit uh, later, it's called the Doctrine of Balaam. And it's interesting where we find it in Revelation. One commentator said of him, Balaam, I can't figure him out. He's talked about in the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Nehemiah, Micah, Peter, Jude, and Revelation. In fact, he's talked about much more than is Mary, the mother of Jesus. So tell that to your Catholic friend the next time they... <laughs> By the way, here's another parenthetical. Uh, it's not in my notes. And I always know I'm treading on very dangerous ground whenever I veer off. But you know what the last words of Mary were? This is my son, do as he says. The last recorded words of Mary. Okay, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> I feel better now. I had to get that off my chest. Uh, I think you know the why behind the what. With all due respect to those who are truly born again of the Spirit of God, in the Catholic faith, uh, Mary was a sinner. And she needed the Savior just like you and I did. Oh, sure, she was blessed by all means. Absolutely. But she is not a co-redemptrix as the Roman Catholic Church would declare she is. And she certainly would not uh, want anyone ever praying to her as they do. All right, enough of that. I could go on and on, and you know I could. Now, here's what's interesting, and I cannot, you, you'll forgive me, I cannot pass up an opportunity to talk a little bit about this whole Balaam doctrine whenever it comes up in the scriptures. So, uh, I, just, it's just, I cannot resist it. It's too much of a temptation for me. So I want to talk to you about uh, why it was that God wouldn't allow Balaam to succeed in cursing the Israelites no matter how much money Balak paid him. And in addition to knowing that God wouldn't allow him to curse the Israelites, we also know from the book of Numbers why he couldn't curse the Israelites. And that's what I want to uh, show you here. It's found in, of all places, again, the book of Numbers. What's the book of Numbers about? Numbers. Remember the book of Numbers? Wasn't that a, an amazing book? Seriously. I mean, who would have thunk? I mean, the book of Numbers, a book about Numbers, which is why it's called the book of Numbers, would have so much written within it, and in what would be deemed a very insignificant and even boring chapter in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 2. Have you read this chapter lately? Do you like math? Read Numbers chapter 2. It's just a bunch of numbers. It's the numbering of the Israelites, and it's taking an inventory of the Israelites by their tribes and by their families in order to prepare them for the battle that was prepared for them. Now, what in the world would Numbers chapter 2, a list of how many from this tribe were camped here, how many from this tribe were camped here, 
what in the world does that have in terms of an application to me? Well, it has a prophetic, what I like to call scripture picture that's painted on the canvas of this seemingly uninteresting and boring chapter and one for which people, when they come to it, will read very fast through it, if they even do that. They'll just skip it. They'll just, you know, kind of, oh yeah, okay, number, chapter's number uh, three. That's okay. We're, we're with family. If you've done that, that's okay. Okay, heads bowed, eyes closed. I've done. Now, what do we find in Numbers chapter two? And no, I'm not going to read it. We don't have the time. I think uh, you already know what's there, at least most of you. But in that chapter, we have 12 tribes that were numbered, and they were numbered, and they were told to camp in four groups of three tribes each with the tabernacle in the center, and the elected leader of that tribe would fly their banner over their tribes. The banner would have on it like our family coat of arms in our day that's how we would understand it because each tribe had its kind of its symbol its mascot if i can say it that way so we have the list and judah was to be at the head and his camp and those in his camp were to camp to the east and in verses one through nine we have the total number of one hundred and eighty six thousand four hundred and then Ephraim to the west, 108,100. Reuben to the south, 151,450. Dan to the north, 157,600. So we had these four leaders, these four camps, east, west, north, south. I know I completely botched it. I don't know what my <laughs> directions are. But, uh, and in this, we have a fascinating picture that is ever so beautifully woven into the fabric of the book of Revelation. That really hard book to understand. That really scary book to understand. And nobody wants to read the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, we have a parallel with the book of Numbers where we have a picture of the heavenly scene. Now, here's how it is, and here's where it is. Chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Now, remember, this is when John, verse 1, was told to come up hither. And everything from chapter 4, verse 1, he has now a heavenly view and is given the revelation of what will come after the period of church history. And he describes what he sees. He says, in the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. Would you mind if I just called them creations? Creatures just kind of sounds, eh, you know, monsters, right? And it doesn't help because we're told they were covered with eyes in the front and in the back. And the first living creation was a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Okay, how in the world does that connect the dots with numbers and surely our study here in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 23? Uh, well, I'm so glad you asked. I want you to notice these comparisons between the scene that we have here with the Israelites in Numbers and what we have here in Revelation. First, in Numbers, the tabernacle is at the center of the camps. You have the four camps, east, west, north, south. The tabernacle is at the center. In Revelation, it's the throne that's at the center. In Numbers, you have four groups of three tribes from front to back. In Revelation, you have four living creations with eyes in front and back. In Numbers, the first is led by Judah, 
whose standard was a lion, and in Revelation, the first creature was like a lion. In Numbers, the tribe of Ephraim had a standard with an ox. In Revelation, the second creation was like an ox. In Numbers, the tribe of Reuben had a standard with a man, the face of a man. And in Revelation, the third creation had a face like a man. In Numbers, the fourth group is led by the tribe of Dan, whose standard was an eagle. In Revelation, the fourth cre cre creation was like a flying eagle. Okay, now, please stay with me. It's all going to tie together amazingly. The tribes at the head of the four camps with their standards were, again, Judah, Ephraim, Reuben, and Dan. And the camp was to be in the four directions, east, west, north, south, and the face on the four standards, like the four creations, was that of a lion, ox, man, and eagle. And it ties in ever so beautifully with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in how they present Jesus in four ways. Matthew presents him to the Jew as the Messiah from the tribe, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and focuses on what Jesus said. That's Matthew. Mark presents Jesus to the Romans as the servant like an ox and focuses on what Jesus did. And Luke presents Jesus to the Greeks the perfect man, right? As the son of man, like the face of a man, and focuses on how he appeared. And John presents Jesus to the church as the son of God, which in typology, the eagle is a picture of deity. And it focuses on who Jesus Christ was. Now, here is how it would have looked to Balaam. And this is why... He could not curse the Israelites. Balak, we're told, takes him out of frustration, threatening not to pay him. You told me you would curse him, curse them, and I offered to pay you. We had an agreement. You're not meeting up to your end of the deal. So he takes him, he says, it m must be our location. So he takes him to a higher peak where he has virtually a bird's eye view of the camp of the Israelites. And he tries to, you know, pronounce the curse, and instead, out of his mouth comes the most glorious blessing. You remember happy days? I know this is going to date me. Remember, remember the fawns? He could never say, I do, I. Remember that? Yeah? You don't? Okay, never mind. Sorry, it was a bad illustration. But he could just not speak that word. Balaam could not speak the curse. What came out of his mouth was only a blessing. Why? Because of what he saw when Balak took him to the highest peak, he saw the picture of the cross of Jesus Christ pre-crucifixion. The tabernacle at the middle, John 1.14. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. That's the person of Jesus Christ at the center on the cross. And you take those numbers, and it's interesting because the east and the west tribes were uh, smaller than the numbers of the south and about the same as the numbers of the north tribe. Can you imagine Balaam trying to pronounce this curse? And he's looking down on what some estimate to be approximately two to three million Israelites camped in the formation of the cross. That's why he couldn't curse them. It was in the form of, and it foreshadowed the cross and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. See, Jesus Christ took upon himself the curse of all our sin on that cross, thus we are no longer under the curse of the law. There is therefore no, now no curse, no condemnation for them that are in Christ. 
trusting in Christ. So whenever the enemy hires your Balaam to curse you, to attack you, to mess with you, he can't. Why? Because of the cross. God will take that curse and he will turn it into a blessing because he loves you and the curse was already accomplished and paid for. Galatians 3, 10 through 14. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Boy, are we learning this in Romans or what? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, he's quoting, guess where? Deuteronomy chapter 21. We studied it two weeks ago. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree, that wooden cross from that wooden tree. Okay, important life lesson here. We'd be remiss to not just take one more moment and look at it with regards to what happens next. Do you realize that ultimately Balak succeeds in his goal of having the Israelites cursed? But it's not... Balaam pronouncing it upon them, they bring it upon themselves. How? Well, we read again in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. That's the doctrine of Balaam, and it's no wonder that of all places we read about it in the letter to the church of Pergamum, or Pergamos, depending on which translation you have. Interesting, you know how the name is the nature? Every one of those seven churches, the names describes the nature of that church. And Pergamum, per, perverted, gamum, gamos, gami, managami, polygami, a perverted marriage. In other words, I couldn't pronounce a curse on you outwardly, but I could get you to sin against God and bring that curse upon you inwardly. You're going to do all the dirty work for me. And that's why we read in Revelation 2.14, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching or doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Before we move on to verse 7, let me just say this, and maybe this is for someone here tonight. You are your own worst enemy. When Satan tempts you, when Satan attacks you, don't cooperate with him. Don't do his bidding for him. I mean, could you imagine? Satan can take the day off and celebrate. He's got you already doing that which will bring the curse upon you that he could not bring upon you outwardly himself. So he will entice you. He will seduce you. He will tempt you and get you to disobey God, and in so doing, you will bring upon yourself the consequences of that disobedience. That's the doctrine of Balaam. 
See, there are consequences. Yes, there's forgiveness if we confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9, the Christian bar of soap, as it's been called. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. There's two, a two-step process. The forgiveness is instantaneous, but the cleansing is a process that takes time of purifying us and cleansing us of that right unrighteousness, but the forgiveness is instantaneous. See, sometimes there are consequences to our sins, to our disobedience against God. Verse 7, You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. Oh, thankfully, uh, actually this covers me on both sides. Because <laughs> my mom uh, from, you know, the Moab, the uh, Edomites, the Moabites, but an Edomite, that twin brother, by the way, of Esau, and my dad, uh, an Egyptian. So we're in. <laughs> I'm in. I can go to the assembly, which is why I'm here. <laughs> but they were allowed entrance into the assembly, but for different reasons. First, Esau was a blood relative to the Israelites. And secondly, Egypt under Joseph provided for the Israelites. And it's in stark contrast to the Ammonites and the Moabites, which were neither. Now, here's another lesson. It's simply this. When you are gracious to God's people, God is in turn gracious to you. God will bless you when you bless his people. In the New Testament, we have the parallel passage, if you will, of being good to those especially of the faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in our treatment of them, our interaction with them. We need to be gracious to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 9, when the army goes out against your enemies, then keep yourself from every wicked thing. If there is any man among you who becomes unclean by some occurrence in the night, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp, but it shall be when evening comes that he shall wash with water, and when the sun sets, he may come into the camp. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out, and you shall have an implement among your equipment, and when you sit down, are you getting all this? <laughs> and when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. Ew. For the Lord your God, verse 14, walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. This is a memorization text, isn't it? Yeah, scripture memorization, uh, and you shall cover your refuse. All right. Um, here, here's what I want to do, and I, you know, you, again, I don't want to get into all the, you know, nitty-gritty, dirty details here, but I want you to notice that conspicuously absent from the narrative is why God is telling them to his, observe these practical sanitary practices within their camp. In other words, he says, this is what I want you to do, but he doesn't tell them why he wants them to do it. Uh, why do you want me to go outside the camp? Why do you want the cleansing process to be like this? Why do you want me to cover up? The, he, and he, he doesn't tell them why. Why? I think it's that sometimes we just need to trust God. See, we need to simply trust and obey there's no other way, as the hymn of old <laughs> says. Why? Because God's ways are higher than our ways, and he knows what's best for us. You know, in parenting, sometimes I will give my kids the why behind the what. And sometimes they'll insist on it and even demand it. You know, because, and, and sometimes I'll just say to them, I'm not going to explain why. And I'll just give them that proverbial, you know, parental uh, statement and answer that every parent has earned the God-given right to tell their kids, because I said so. That's why. Right? You've done that. 
Why? Because I said so. My four-year-old daughter. You need to take a bath, Sabia. Why? Because I said so. Why? You know, <laughs> because I said so. Well, what's the why behind the why? Now, sometimes I'll deem it necessary to fill in the blanks and explain to them why it is that I don't want them juggling knives on the H1. And I mean, it's, you know, I just don't think that it would be wise. And, you know, in the dais that thou doest this, thou shalt surely stab thyself and get hitteth by a careth. That's why. You know, and sometimes I'll just tell them, you're just going to need to trust me on this one. There's a reason for it, but I just need for you to obey me, no questions asked. I need you to be like Abraham, who left Ur of the Chaldees, not knowing where he was going. God didn't give him an itinerary. God just said, leave. <laughs> well, where am I leaving to? I'm quite comfortable here. Things are going well here. My father's here. I really don't want to go. You're saying go? Where are we going? Not telling. Why? Because I said so. Leave. So by faith, you leave going, no, not knowing where you're going. That's called faith. What's faith? It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yet unseen. Evidence is a strong word. It's the forensics of that which I hope for but is yet unseen. Now, what's the antithesis of faith? Sight. How do we want to walk with the Lord? By sight. I want to see it. I want to know it. I want in on it, right? It's kind of like we have to have some semblance of control in our Adamic sin nature. We want to know what God's doing, when God's going to do it, why God's going to do it, where God's going to do it. And sometimes, and I've experienced this, I have the scars to prove it actually, God will withhold that from me if for no other reason he's trying to keep me from helping him out. Because he knows me. And he knows what I'll do. And if he says to me, well, this is why, or this is where we're going, or this is what I'm doing, I'm like, cool, let's do it. Hey, all right, let's, where do you want me to? <laughs> I mean, it's so cute when my daughter wants to help me out. But mercy, it takes me so much more time to do that which I could have done had she not, in her cuteness, wanted to help me do. I mean, it's so cute, but you want to help me? And I've found myself telling my boys this on many an occasion. Hey, uh, I want to help. You want to help me? Don't help me. <laughs> you want to help me? Stay out of my way. It's uh, mean, but it, it's true because I need to do this, and I don't want you in my way. It reminds me of one of my favorite hymns. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Quoting Isaiah. Can you imagine the imagery of the clay, the dirt, the mud on the potter's wheel? Saying, hey, don't do that. No, let's do it this way. <laughs> no, I'm the clay. He's the potter. He's the one calling the shots. I'm only the clay. He knows what's best. Verse 15, you shall not give back to his master the slave who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst in the place which he chooses within one of your gates where it seems best to him you shall not oppress him. Now, remember that Moses is sort of tying up some loose ends. These are last-minute instructions because they're only days away from entering the promised land. So he's got to address some of these issues that they're going to encounter once they enter and take possession of the promised land. And here he's dealing with the matter of a slave who escapes this cruel master and he seeks refuge in the land of the Israelites, in their midst. Now, what are they to do when that happens? Well, they're to allow the slave to dwell within their gates. And interesting, it's to be a place of their choosing. And don't oppress them. Don't enslave them again. Okay, well now, what's the application to me? I think it speaks to how it is that 
We are to welcome and allow those who are escaping the slavery of sin into the world and into the church. I shriek in horror when I think of how that first day I stepped foot into a church at age 19, coming off of drugs, coming off of alcoholism, coming off of every addiction known at that time. And I, and I did not look the part, and I surely did not dress the part because I didn't have the clothes to wear to dress the part. And I walked in with the only Bible that I could understand at the time because of so much brain damage, and that was the Good News Bible. That was my vocabulary, and even that was a stretch. What does that word mean, the? And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's how, that's, that's the pit that he found me in and saved me out of. And when I stepped foot in that church, 1982, Calvary Chapel, Spokane, and here's a guy, he looked worse than me. And he was the worship leader. And he's got longer hair than me. And he's got on these, you know, jeans and this T-shirt. And see, I grew up in a church where you had to wear a suit and tie by golly, and if you didn't, you weren't welcome. And boy, you walk in and and you're not dressing the part, and your Bible isn't a King James. You're, they're going to let you know it. They're going to give you a stink eye. And you sit down next to them, and they scoot over. You know, I showered. How do you know that you're not entertaining an angel unaware? They've come out of the slavery to sin in the world, Egypt, a type of the world. And when they come into your assembly, you're to welcome them and give them a place to sit of their choosing. In other words, oh, we have a seating section for people like you, way in the back, parking lot actually. You know, I've said this before, and it's been a while, but I never want Calvary Chapel Kaneohe to ever become a clicky church, okay? And if I, and I hope you don't misunderstand my heart here, but as long as I have the privilege of being the pastor of this church, I'll, and I, I see little pockets, you know, and I see that, you know, these little groups, and they're kind of like, hey, you know, it's us four and no more kind of thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Palestinian on you. <laughs> you know, when someone walks in that front door and they might not smell very good or look very good, we want to welcome them and we want to love on them because you have no idea what they've come out of. Never forget one thing that Oswald Chambers said. He said, you never judge another because you don't know the path that they've walked. You have no idea what they've gone through. And they're seeking refuge in a safe sanctuary. And they see us, and we become the hands and the feet of Jesus himself to that person. I don't know how many times I, I've seen it. I, this is why, as a pastor, I am part of the Calvary Chapel movement because you come just as you are. And don't try to clean them up. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You know, that's another thing we try to do. You know, we go, well, let's, you know, they're saying, all right, now let's get you a suit and tie. <laughs> no, <laughs> especially not here, right? I mean, it's like anathema. I found that out the hard way. You know, I come from the mainland. One of the best pieces of advice my father-in-law gave me when he was still alive was that they do things very differently over here. Don't come off like a, you know, mainland hotshot, you know. And so I had to, you know, get rid of all my ties. 
I gave them to the denominational pastors. <laughs> I just get, I, we better, I was, sorry. Verse 17, there shall be no ritual harlot of the daughters of Israel or a perverted one of the sons of Israel. You shall not bring the wages of a harlot or the price of a dog to the house of the Lord your God for any vowed offering, for both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Well, this probably speaks for itself. It's a clear prohibition against prostitution of any kind in any way by anyone. And again, this was a sacred practice in the pagan culture. This is what they did. And God did not want the Israelites imitating the paganites. The common denominator in everything that Moses is preaching to them about in this sermon is about that. You are sanctified. You are a set-apart people, God's chosen people. Verse 19, you shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. So here Moses is prohibiting the charging of interest to another Israelite, whether it was monetary or material. Why? Because they were brothers. But if they were foreigners, man, you could charge no, it wasn't <laughs> you could charge them interest fairly. <laughs> but notice that God attaches a blessing to this. In other words, if you're obedient to this, God's going to bless you for it. Conversely, if you're disobedient to this, then God can't bless you for it. In other words, it's not that God doesn't want to, it's that God can't. Verse 21, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be a sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. In other words, this wasn't a vow that God commanded them to make. But it has to do with both making and keeping vows. And when one made a vow to the Lord and they were in no way to delay in paying that vow to the Lord, because if they did, then God would require it of them. Do you get the idea that God kind of takes vows pretty seriously? We read about it in Ecclesiastes. Don't be too quick to make a vow. Uh, I'm very careful when I make a vow to the Lord. In fact, uh, well, my vows are not even really so much promises. Let me, let me qualify that since I just dug myself into this puka. Um, I cannot make a vow to the Lord. I cannot keep a promise that I've made to the Lord. Why? Because I cannot keep the commandments of the Lord. I can pretty much state with a degree of certainty that whenever we try to vow to the Lord that we'll never do something again, invariably we'll end up doing it. I make a promise to the Lord, you know, and with all due respect to the promise keepers, it was a powerful movement. God m made it very fruitful, but I can't keep those seven promises. In fact, I, I break them often. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you how many times. She's got the recorded time, 8.51 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when we don't keep that promise or we don't follow through on that vow is that it just brings condemnation. And we're bringing ourselves under the law without even really knowing it. Because then all of a sudden now, we're performing, we're working, we're trying in the energy of our own flesh. See, God will always give us the how of the Holy Spirit to do the what of his holy word. It's not by might, not by power, willpower, but by my spirit, 
says the Lord. Well, let's finish up the chapter, verse 24. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in your container. When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. Okay? What's this talking about? Well, we have an allowance for the Israelites picking grapes to eat from their neighbor's vineyard so that when they're traveling, they have some provision of sustenance. But while they were allowed to eat from their neighbor's crops, they were not allowed to harvest their neighbor's crops for what would be deemed obvious reasons. Now, you remember uh, Luke's gospel when Jesus on the Sabbath is with his disciples uh, traveling? And they're walking through a wheat field and they rub the grain, uh, the wheat heads, in between, and they start eating it. And they're condemned for it. That's what they were doing. They were doing what we are, they were allowed to do in Deuteronomy, which was when you're traveling and you're in your neighbor's you know, field and you're hungry and you need something to eat, it's okay to you know, eat their uh, wheat, but just don't harvest it. Don't pull a combine out of the, you know, <laughs> and the truck and start, you know, harvesting it. Uh, that's not yours, but it's there for you. There's an allowance for you to do that. Interesting. I think sometimes that that's true for us. We glean from others. You know, there's something that someone has for us, a word fitly spoken. Sometimes it's a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. What's the difference? A word of knowledge is when God gives us knowledge or he lets us know and the wisdom, the word of wisdom, the companion gift that the Holy Spirit gives is what to do about what we know. It's been said that knowledge is information but wisdom is application. See, I'm keenly aware that the only ministry that takes place here is not between pulpit and pew. It's between you and you. Let me explain. See, sometimes you'll be talking to somebody. You'll be in their field, and they'll just speak that word fitly spoken, and it's a word of wisdom, and it's exactly what you needed to hear. It's almost like the perfect manna for the moment, and you know it's from the Lord, and the Lord is speaking to you through them. That's ministry. Ministry, to, you're ministering to them. And they're ministering in turn to you. And I love seeing that. And I love it when I see, you know, people praying together. Hey, let me pray for you. Man, you're going through, I don't, I don't there are no easy answers. I don't even know what to say in your situation, but I, I can pray for your situation. Let me, let me pray for you. That, that is powerful. That is so powerful. And, and there's this, you know, provision, if you will, from their field. Why don't you all stand? Lord, thank you for your word. What a <laughs> crazy chapter, really, but what a cool chapter, too, actually. Lord, thank you that we have this book in our Bibles. Thank you that we have this chapter in this book in our Bibles. Lord, thank you that... We can leave here tonight knowing that your Holy Spirit is going to take everything that we've seen and read and heard here tonight and that you're going to minister it to us and really apply it to us, the wisdom from above that's first pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated and full of mercy and good fruits without hypocrisy or partiality. Lord, that's our prayer tonight. Lord, we thank you so much.